This is The Instigators, presented by Seneca Resorts and Casinos. Nothing else comes close. We are going to overtime! Welcome into The Instigators Overtime Podcast, presented by our friends at Seneca Resorts and Casinos. Marty, really nice to see the development path that many Amherst were on this year as they buy for spots with the Sabres next season. And the forwards specifically had to have learned an immense amount from our guest today, Michael Pekka. Yeah, I would think that uh, he's got a lot to uh, teach to uh, young players, not only because he played at such high level, but he worked with youth hockey, uh, you know, with his son from the early age all the way until his kid was uh, playing junior hockey. So I think Pex would have a lot of uh, things to relate, not just as a player, but also as a coach going through youth hockey level himself. When you're serious about the game, bet on Buffalo at the only sports books in Western New York. Seneca Resorts and Casinos betting counters are open daily and self-service betting kiosks are available 24-7 at all three locations. So whether you visit Seneca, Niagara, Allegheny, or Buffalo Creek, the sports lounge features the latest lines and multiple screens so you never miss a play. The sports book at Seneca Resorts and Casinos, where the love of the game meets the thrill of the win. Michael, it's great to see you. It's, uh, I mean, it's really the off season and we're going to be talking about a a new set of rosters in Buffalo and Rochester before we know it. What is your lingering takeaway here in the weeks that have followed the the culmination of a a very entertaining end to the Amherst season? Yeah. I I mean, you're left with mixed emotions for sure. I think first and foremost, um, you know, we felt like we had a special group and could have gone deep. Uh, regardless of getting in the back door in the last possible day of the regular season with a a Toronto loss to Belleville. But, um, you know, I think the bitterness of that was quickly squashed away by the big picture stuff, right? Like our main job is to develop the young talent for the Buffalo Sabres. And I think as far as our season in totality, um, I thought, you know, apps, uh, Webby and myself uh, did a, a pretty, pretty sufficient job with, with our youngsters. And I think um, the progress they showed in uh, a lot of different areas of the game, um, the way they performed when they went up to play in Buffalo, I think um, as a whole, we, um, we tried to make sure that that was uh, the focal point of what we're doing, but obviously winning is part of development. And um, you know, the, the veterans we had around that locker room, the Michael Mersh's, the Sean Malone's, the Ethan Prowse, the Brendan Davison's and on and on and on. Um, contributed greatly to the development of our young guys as well. So obviously playoffs, uh, you know, like what we can call three rounds uh, because of the way the the playing round, the first round, second round and whatnot. Uh, you were a big playoff type performer. Your game was perfect for the playoffs, the, the toughness, the, the attention to detail, uh, 200 foot type game. Um, anybody that came and talked to you and asked you about your personal experience in the playoffs and, and how you felt about the game and how you could be, uh, you know, a different players come in playoff time. Nobody really came up because we, we kind of got out ahead of it. Like we would always have little meetings and subtleties with whether it was collectively or, or, or privately. And, you know, the one thing, um, just because, you know, both, both I and, uh, apps recognized the ability and JJ Paterka early in the season, he was a guy and he is a guy that is built for that moment. I think JJ is just a kid that is capable of playing in any situation. And our, you know, the mission this year was to really get him to bind to being a dominant 200 foot player. He loves to score goals. There's no doubt. Um, but we felt that he can become one of our best penalty killers and, you know, it happened organically because of all the COVID and injuries we had, you know, through the end of December and through January and parts of February um, where he stepped up and became just that. I mean, his instincts are incredible and um, he's a kid. And to this day, I still have trouble finding an NHL comparable, like trying to describe to somebody this, this is who reminds me of JJ Paterka uh, because he is unique in a lot of ways. And, um, so, you know, to sorry to, you know, go get off the topic a little bit, but I think we collectively started to build guys up in preparation for that, but also had, you know, meetings leading into the playoffs on, you know, what successful playoff teams are and how they perform and individually. And, um, and we just tried, and, and to that point, we just try to keep everything on a daily basis, exactly the same. It was during the regular season. 
you know, we didn't want to make it, okay, it's playoffs. So, you know, we got to, you know, make sure a little bit more quiet in certain areas to show that you're, you're being more serious. No, it, being a playoff performer um, means you're doing the exact same thing you did in the regular season. And stories that were told is, you know, I tell stories about the 2002 Olympics. In that locker room before the gold medal game, you would think Joe Sackick and, you know, Marty Berdur and these guys were just ready to go out and play a, a, a late July, early August kind of conditioning game or whatever. They were so loose, so relaxed, and they were both unbelievable. And they, they I mean, obviously Hall of Famers are unbelievable. Um, and if you, and, and so when I go through all my history and the guys that always perform well in the playoffs, they were just themselves. You know, people in the playoffs will regress because they put too much pressure on the self on themselves. They try and change what they do. The guys and teams that perform well do exactly what they did in the regular season in the preseason. That's why, that's why we always stress preparation, preparing the same way. So to come back to, to a, you know, a short question, but a long answer is we all season tried to get them ready and prepare them for that scenario. So, um, you know, and we weren't disappointed with them at all. So what, trait or traits does Paterka show us that allowed him to follow your lead, so to speak, to go from prospect 200 foot player and really impressive postseason? I think it was just a matter of gaining confidence in those areas. You know, I think he realized there, you know, you can get enjoyment out of the game other than scoring goals, whether it's making a great defensive play, um, being part of a, an important penalty kill. Like there's other areas that can really stimulate your emotions in a game. And, um, you know, because I, I, I try to explain and, and when you're successful in all those areas, the goals will come. Like he's not a guy that has to chase the goals. <clears throat> so when he was working and being a dominant 200 foot player, I mean, he had, two, three or four hat tricks in the last half of the season. Like it was, it was crazy. Um, and it just, it freed him up. You know, when, when, when you're focused, I use the word focus, but when you're focused on playing a 200 foot game and you're not just solely focused on scoring goals, the amount of pressure you relieve from yourself and the more enjoyment and freeness you have to play the game um, becomes easier. And that showed in JJ's game, he was just, he was a much freer player emotionally and physically and, um, you know, he's young kid. He still had his moments of frustration, but it, it freed his game up to just have a more general perspective of the game instead of just focusing on scoring goals and being a goal scorer. You talk about having him free physically. Um, how big are his legs? Like, how thick is he for a young man? Like, I, you know, you've seen guys like Alexis Zetnik. He'd walk in, he'd have three trunks for ties, right? Like, I just feel like Paterka... I don't know him. I've never seen him in, in that sense, but I feel like he'd have the thickest of legs because of the way he plays. He is a thicker kid. You know, he's a, he's a bulldog for sure. And, and he's only going to get stronger. And um, yeah, I'm not sure what, what his playing weight was. It had to be somewhere around 190, maybe just North of 190. Um, but he's only going to get stronger. He is, he is a thicker built kid um, from head to toe. Um, and, but, but having that and the speed and power that he has the ability to play with, he can, he can be a dominant hockey player. Do you have a favorite uh, personal moment with him this year, either something you viewed him do on the ice or behind the scenes? Well, one of the funniest we, uh, stories we enjoyed telling was so late in the season, you know, we were trying to make this playoff push. We were playing really good hockey, but we really struggled at scoring goals for whatever reason, all of a sudden the goals are drying up and, you know, so we took a practice day and we said, all right, screw the goalies. Uh, we're we're going to have a couple of drills where we're just going to be filling the net. And so the one drill, we called it the dirty bird. And it just puts you in a lot of offensive situations where the name came from. I don't know. Um, so that game that we won eight, one against um, Utica in the last game of the season, JJ had the hat trick. The third was in a penalty shot, but his first two goals came off scenarios exactly like the drill was set up. So he comes to the bench and he looks at Apps and I and uh, cause Apps and I are always standing kind of close together. He goes, Hey guys, what do you think? Angry bird. And I go, I go, it's dirty bird. You idiot. It's not the angry bird. Um, so we ended up, I think we're going to change the name to uh, 
the dirty JJ because it, <laughs> we've had drills throughout the season when guys have performed well. We've, we've changed drills that simulated what they did uh, to their name. But he's just a great, funny kid. Like he's he doesn't talk a ton at times, but when he does, boy, he's he's a funny kid. He takes in everything. So Seth mentioned a story that uh, Jack Quinn was named the rookie of the year. And then you called the fact that JJ was going to be a little ticked off that he didn't get it. And he was going to have a big performance that night. Uh, what's the dynamic between the two of them competitiveness and, uh, and friendship and all of that? Oh, they're, they're super close. And I think the, the reason we saw evolution, I mean, we talk about the veterans, but um Jack Quinn was a, it was an, a huge leader for us um, this season because of the, what he gained last year, you know, from Mersh and Scarfo and these guys who helped build him up a little bit last year. Uh, JJ started to spend a lot of time with Quinner as the season went on. He was in the shooting room with him. He was doing a lot of things with him, and that and that's that's exactly what you want to see as the Sabres organization is starting to see these young kids succeed together and learn together. Um, But, you know, I think they, they just became really good friends. They love playing together. Um, they're always having dialogue together. You know, we finish up our power play meetings or, you know, they, they, they get together and start talking right away. So, you know, because of that relationship, I've given them a lot of autonomy on the power play to kind of decide certain things that they'd like to do together and give them a little bit more freedom to do things. Um, but yeah, that night was funny because we found out, or at least apps found out that Quinn won rookie of the year before the game. And I said, well, that's not going to sit well with JJ. I said, I would bet all my money on a hat trick from JJ tonight. <laughs> and sure enough, he came through. So, um, that's how JJ is, man. He's a competitive kid, man. All of the stuff that you've said already is just, it's been so on display. I know Marty and I, when we were watching the preseason games with the Sabres, you, you were looking at just how how unique that was your word Paterka looked among his peers out there and it's not like he's off the charts Gretzky-esque it's just that there there's he's just a unique player and so when if we were to shift it to Quinn what what is it about Quinn that you know will allow him to find his way because his points came in a you know not just from like a singular shooting area this year too. We kind of marveled that, uh, as you said, you gave him some autonomy on the power play and, and there were many times he took great advantage of that. Yeah. And, and before the ankle injury, I mean, Jack had established himself as one of our go-to penalty killers too. So, you know, I, I mean, as much as, you know, we've spent time on JJ being a great 200 foot player, Jack is equally a great 200 foot player, mainly because he takes pride in it. You know, it's, it's sometimes hard um to really help these young offensive prospects really embrace a 200 foot game you know I, i i've told the story even when i coached youth hockey and, and junior hockey um there aren't many players if any that are given carte blanche offensively with no defensive responsibility ovechkin was given it for years but eventually ovechkin had to do a little bit if you want to win a championship um and so and that's the cream of the crop I mean, that's the best goal scorer potentially in NHL history. So if you want to, you know, our whole message with all these young guys is look, your offense might give you a path to the national hockey league, but it's your 200 foot game. That's going to keep you there because you're not going to score at a level. That's going to keep you in the national hockey league um, just solely on offense. So, and, and they both embrace it. They both understand it. They work hard at it. The thing with Jack is, is he's just, he's so committed to getting better every single day in every aspect of his game. Um, he wants video. He asks questions. He seeks answers. Um, he's in the shooting room. He's always talking to, to, to the veteran guys. I mean, he, he does everything it takes to become a, a, a really good hockey player. And, you know, and, and the, the great thing is, and, you know, apps and I, and Webby, we, we've always talked about this, you know, Jack, JJ and, and Krebs, The three of them are completely different hockey players, but the amazing thing and the blessed thing about, you know, the organization to have those three great young prospects is they're all completely different players, but they're all hardworking first hockey players. Like they're, they're hard workers on and off the ice. JJ's a little bit younger and was a little bit more immature at the start of the season, but it was his first crack at, you know, North American pro hockey where, You know, Peyton was in Vegas and a bit of Henderson last year and this year. And Jack obviously was in, in Rochester uh, last year. So 
but JJ caught up quick and the three of them uh, were just such a treat uh, with their professionalism and their work habits. Okay, so we all know that for Quinn, uh, the playoff uh, production was not where it was in the regular season. Um, have you ever had you yourself a playoff where you came off of it and thought it wasn't my best and how did you recover from it? And how can you help Jack maybe say, Hey, um, you know, there's always next year. So how did you deal with it personally? And how can you translate that to Jack Quinn moving on to next year? Well, I think the one thing that Jack got value out, out of maybe not having the offensive success that he wanted was he helped us win hockey games um, in the Utica series without having to score a goal. And I think there's so much value for these young guys to realize, look, I, I, if I, if I don't have it, if I don't have that offensive touch right now, you know, he was on the four check, he was going to the net, he was creating opportunities. He was playing great team defense um, that he was giving us the ability to win as much without scoring as games when he did score. And I think, You know, for me, when I went through it, if the offense wasn't there, obviously I knew what I had a responsibility of playing stingy, strong, physical defense. And so if, if one thing's there, which goes to the point of, you know, if you want to be productive in the National Hockey League and be on a winning team, you've got to be able to perform even when you're not scoring because it's going to happen to everybody. And if you have other elements of your game to contribute to success of the team, well, then you're such a valuable player. And, and, and Jack proved why he was so valuable to us because he willed us to victory in that Utica series without scoring, without having to produce offense. And, um, you know, you can't say enough about him for being able to do that. Do you remember the 96-97 playoffs for you? 96-97, that would have been the Flyers. Uh, Ottawa, Ottawa, then Philly. Ottawa, Ottawa then, then Philly. Philly. Yeah. Okay, so just funny because I looked up this morning some stats. Like Jack Quinn played 10 playoff games this year at two assists. Um, do you remember your responsibility in the Ottawa series in 97? Yeah, I was I was uh, ordered to shut Yashin down. Yes, and you did a fantastic <laughs> job. And so do you know how many games you played that year in the playoffs? I'm guessing 10. And how many points did you have? I'm guessing two assists. You had two assists in 10 games in 96, 97 playoffs. Same well, as Jack Quinn, but no, you but found how, a different role. How come he only played 10? Because the team would have played 12. I, I don't know, Pex, if you missed a couple of games in that year's playoffs. Yeah, I think I think in that season, I think the end of the Ottawa series, I got back spasms and might have missed the first two games of the Philly series. Ah. Well, I think that's what it was. Just, just to further your point, though, Marty, it, 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 he knew his responsibility, and then he took it up another notch in 99 in <laughs> yeah. the sweep against Ottawa. And ultimately, Alexi Yashin, your future teammate uh, on the it's island. Don't remind uh, me of that. <laughs> <laughs> was it just teammate or line mate? Would it ever been line mate, too, or at some point in, in Long Island? No, I don't think if th there might have been an experimental phase of a couple games where we might have been line mates because he was having trouble uh, for most of his first year at winning face off. So um, he was getting frustrated. Alexi was at always having to chase the puck on every shift. So um, I don't think it I don't think it lasted that long because it kind of it kind of messed up our, our lineup and stuff. But uh, no, he was actually a super teammate. I, 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 I don't I, I say that with all sincerity, he was actually a super guy to, to be on a team with, uh, at least with my experience. So you mentioned uh, Peyton Krebs and you just mentioned face-offs and I can't help but ask this with a bit of a smile and smirk and laugh. You guys keep stats on everything. Do you have any way of confirming that Peyton Krebs by far got tossed out of the most face-offs? <laughs> It seemed yeah. like every time I watched, it was him pleading with the officials. <laughs> and, 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 but it's also really important here because what can you teach him through this? Well, I think that's a case of a young guy, you know, trying to find his way into being a successful face-off guy. And I think um, he doesn't have one set thing he likes to do. And nor did I, I was more of a counter puncher. I'd find what a centerman was good at and try and take that away and win face offs based on that. Um, you know, trying to, you know, I think that's going to be the key to Peyton because um, he's got such quick hands. I think he's such a highly, highly intelligent player. 
Um, but I think he was just fidgeting around. I think some of those ejections from the face-off circle might've been self-provoked just so he didn't have to take another face-off and hurt his percentage maybe. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you know what though? I mean, but when you do struggle, you tend to want to cheat and jump a little bit early. And I think that's what, what the case was with, with him. And, um, you know, and it's, it's tough though, as a centerman, you get better by finding a rhythm by taking a lot of face-offs and obviously he spent the majority of the season in Buffalo playing the wing and a little bit at center. And when he came to us, he was a center and then he was a little bit on the wing and it's, it's tough when you just go in once in a while, when, when you're a true centerman to not take a lot of face-offs. So, you know, hopefully um, when he comes back in camp, he's ready to go and taking a lot of face-offs and, uh, and get dialed in. So that's interesting what you said about yourself as, as I always thought there was only one approach to winning a faceoff is you go in and you kind of see what side you're on. If you got to win it back, or if you want to win it like to your forehand back and whatnot, but you said you try to neutralize the other sentiment. So uh, how, how did you study everybody? Was it just by experience or did you uh, have a kind of a book on what, what uh, centers were trying to do? Yeah, I'm sure. I, I mean, I had a mental book. I'm sure similar to you, Marty, being a goalie, having, you know, you know, certain shooters tendencies and where they yeah. like to go. I, I mean, I, you know, you take enough face-offs against guys, you really get an idea of what they like to do. And like, for example, Matt Sundin did one thing. He was a bulldog on his backhand um, and he was bigger and stronger than I was. So I knew I couldn't go backhand to backhand. If I try to go forehand, um, you know, he was too strong if he got over my stick. So I just, I had to, you know, apply math and science and I had to create angles. And so I wouldn't move my stick a whole lot at times. And I'd make sure I just angled my stick. So when his stick came in, the puck would squirt to where I wanted it to go. And so you just got to find certain ways to manipulate the guy's stick or just create an angle for, uh, for the path of the puck. And, you know, it's in, in Washington, I, I had guys do that against Patrice Bergeron, who's the best there ever was because he's got one thing he does. He tweaks it a couple of different ways, depending on how somebody's trying to win a face off, but it's basically the same move. And I started to have guys just work on creating that angle and the puck would just pop where they wanted it to go. And so that's kind of what I was because I was more of a handsy kind of um, intellectual type player rather than a bulldog in the face off circle. Bulldog everywhere else. Yeah. I guess I had to balance it out then. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing that it, it's amazing that you just brought up Bergeron because obviously we were going to go there. I mean, Michael, seven straight years, you were in the top five in voting for the Selkie. You won it twice. Now Bergeron's won it five times, which is an NHL record, which is for someone who grew up through the Canadians, you know, dominating in the seventies and Bob Ganey, and then to Craig Ramsey with Buffalo. It is amazing that somebody has been able to win this award five times and become the king of that. So kind of to what Marty asked you earlier, as far as, you know, what do you take from your experiences that you pass on to these players? Like what else do you take from guys like Bergeron and incorporate it into your teachings? And, and how do these, you know, is it easier for your prospects to latch on to a guy who is actively playing in the NHL right now, like Bergeron? Does, does that help in the teaching process? Yeah, I think that fresh perspective helps for sure because then they can continue to watch them instead of having to go back and pull up video. They can actually watch a game uh, on TV a couple of times a week. Um, but yeah, I mean, Patrice Bergeron, first and foremost, is probably one of the most incredible human beings I've ever met in my life. He's such an amazing person. And being that he's such an amazing person can help you understand his level of consistency, his level of commitment to his team, um, his unselfish play. I mean, you know, a lot of people make the argument that, yeah, it's, it's easy to have success when you've had the same two line mates for five, six, seven years, whatever it is, but it's his ability to continue to win face-offs, continue to be one of the best penalty killers in the league and playing in all situations and being very successful in all situations. But he's just a true team first oriented hockey player. And he's made sacrifices early on in his career, not, not in the last, five, six, seven years early on in his career that first and foremost, he wanted to be a winning hockey player. And to do that, he had to play a team first style of game. And, and, and I remember him, his rookie year, he, he really hasn't changed other than he's gotten more dominant, but he's still the same person, the same type of hockey player. And it's, it was a, it was a real treat. I mean, I, I got to present his second Selkie to him in, in Vegas that year. And 
Um, just my interactions with them and conversations with them, truly, truly a class act. And someday soon he'll be a welcome addition to the Hall of Fame for sure. Okay, so this is interesting to me because there's only been, I believe, four players listed as wingers win the Selkie Trophy. Bob Gainey was listed as a left winger. Uh, Craig Ramsey was listed as a left winger. Dirk Graham as a right winger. And Yuri Lettinen as a right winger. Right winger. Everybody else that has won the Selkie was listed as a center. Do you see... Anybody in this uh, Sabres Rochester organization, maybe as a, maybe as a center, but also as a winger that could be this type of defensive, responsible Selkie type player. Uh, you know what? I think if, if Dylan Cousins wanted to be that type of dominant, big, strong face off 200 foot center, I think he can be that guy. I really do. I think he's got the physical makeup for it. Um, you know, I mean, the amazing thing was as frustrating as early this, in the season it was for him, you know, when did his season start to take a bit of a turn when he was put up against Austin Matthews, he was put up against Connor McDavid, you know, head to head. And, you know, that brought the best out of him. Yeah. It took his focus away. You know, like we were talking about players uh, that we had took their folks away from just wanting to be a goal scorer and frustrated about the offensive totals it reshifts your focus and it just showed how good and reliable of a 200 foot hockey player he could be. Um, I think if there's somebody on this roster that can be a, a potential Selkie trophy candidate and winner, um, I think it'd be Dylan cousins. Asplund got some votes this year. Um, what do you see in Asplund's game moving forward that uh, regardless of how high he may ascend in, in future Selkie voting results? Well, he's obviously a guy that's very versatile, right? I mean, he can play all three, four positions and, you know, just in conversations with, with uh, Seth about, you know, what, what Aspen was like last year for parts of the year in Rochester. Um, he's just grown to be a little bit more tenacious and aggressive going to the net harder, going to harder areas of the ice. And, you know, if you're going to be a reliable uh, player for your team in all situations, you've got to be willing to go into those areas of the ice and win puck battles and do all that sort of stuff. And so his commitment to do that this year um, and, and getting some votes should give him a lot of confidence to come back next year and, and now, now improve upon it now become a little bit more dominant. If he, you know, want to be, you know, a dominant penalty killer where every time there's like, that's the one thing I really took pride in is every time our team took a penalty, regardless of who I played for, I just jumped the bench. I didn't even wait for the coach to call my number. I just jumped the bench because I had a feeling he'd call my number, but I just, I embraced it. I loved it. And I knew I was going to help the team in that respect. And, um, but he's got to be a guy that every time there's a penalty now, Donnie Granado says, Aspie, go, you know, like he, that, that's what he's got to look to, to the role. He's got to look to be dominant at for this team now. How about uh, Artu Rutzelainen? Um, he definitely had a lot a production, especially in the playoffs. And there was some rumors that maybe he'd want to go back to Europe. Uh, you know, we'll see how that plays out. But where do you see him uh, being uh, as a type of player in the fit moving forward, if that is with Buffalo? Well, I think, uh, I think if it's with Buffalo, I think, I think R2 is going to have to, you know, compete for that, maybe that fourth line center responsibility. You know, like, I think for the last two, three months of the season with us, he was, he was player of the month one month, but he was just so dominant. He was such a leader. Um, it was, it was incredible to watch him on a daily basis. I mean, he was, and then through the playoffs was just, it was a different story. I mean, he was just on another level and it was amazing in the exit interview, um, his response to how he felt. He's like in the playoffs, I just felt like I can do whatever I wanted. I mean, that's an incredible statement from a player at that level to say, I just felt like I can do whatever I wanted. I think what he needs to really make sure he brings next year, if he wants to play in Buffalo, is he's got to be, and like we we're talking about Aspen, he's got to be an elite penalty killer and he's got to be dominant in the face-off circle. If he can do those two things for Buffalo, because the work will be there, the speed will be there, all that stuff will be there for him, then he's got a shot, you know, but those two things have to be uh, at the top of the list. Did you, like in the exit interview, did you tell him that? Like, is it oh, yeah. something oh, that yeah, you would no, tell yeah. him straight on those two things, do this this summer, come to camp and that spot could be yours. hundred percent, hundred percent. Any organization loves him. They love his professionalism, his work habits. I think what he brings to the table. So yeah, that's, 
that's something that was uh, clearly conveyed for sure. We were wondering before we started today, Michael, um, if you, if there is anyone that you could view in the organization, um, maybe someone that's been drafted but hasn't joined yet, is there anyone that plays a style remotely close to how you played the game? Is it even fair to bring up a question like that based on how, you know, hitting has changed over the course of time since you played? Um, I, I, I can't think of anybody off the top of my head. Um, you know, we could not, need her. <laughs> yeah, I'm not that familiar with, uh, with, you know, some of the more recent draft picks and things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I can tell you if we get a kid into Rochester that even some way remotely comes close, I'll, I'll groom them real quick. I'll groom them real quick and we'll get up, we'll get up to the edge of some of the suspensions and fines. We'll see if we can, we can see if we can create one. <laughs> Uh, oh, saying that, I don't know if you got suspended or fined, but do you remember the hit yet at Sergey Gonchar in uh, Washington? Obviously, you remember, yeah. but uh, did you get suspended or fined for that one? No, I didn't even get a penalty. Um, <laughs> but the thing, so the thing is, if you look at the hit, like, again, every, every, a lot of my hits, people say that I was in the air, but at the point of contact, my feet were still on the ice. It's just my, my energy was still going forward. So after the contact, you know, then my feet came up. Um, he actually took a retaliation penalty on me on that play. And we ended up going on the power play, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> so Tell what was the biggest hit you've delivered? Well, the biggest hit was, I think I ever delivered was probably still my rookie year, the Timo Solani hit, you know, I think, uh, I did get a two minute interference penalty. It was, it was just on the line. That's when the NHL was a three second rule. I think, uh, that after a guy passed the puck, you can hit him. <laughs> um, but I hit him and he did a complete 360 in the air and he was concussed, went to the locker room, thought he was in St. Louis instead of Vancouver. And wow. crazy thing is I think he played the next game two days later, but, um, I ended up fracturing my cheekbone on the play and missed six weeks. Um, but, but I think by far that, that was kind of like my egregiation to the national hockey, like everywhere I went, it was like, oh my God, that Solani hit. And then when I came to Buffalo and, you know, I jump on the treadmill to do my VO2 max test, um, Doug McKenney comes up and goes, huh, I thought you'd be bigger. And I felt like saying, yeah, screw you. you know? <laughs> yeah. but Dougie was our strength and conditioning coach. Yeah. So coming from him, you're probably like, well, I guess I know what you want me to do. Put on some weight. Yeah. But, but I tell you what, I love Doug McKinney. I mean, he did, he did add a ton of strength and, and stuff to my body. So um, he was great, but I, that was a funny moment. Do you like the game that you're seeing in the playoffs right now at the NHL level? I think the speed of the game is incredible. Um, I, I, I love the way the game's being played. You know, I don't, I mean, I, I, I do love the physicality. Like, I love Trubis hits, you know, how they've turned games and series for the New York Rangers and adds an element to a young, fast, dynamic hockey team. Lindgren is a younger player, but he also adds an incredible physical element. Like I think the Rangers are one team that have a real good balance of speed and physicality going right now. Um, but it is, it's, it's been incredible to watch it, it, the speed and the goal tending and the goal scoring and, a lot of stuff going on has been uh, has been a treat to watch. So you put your body on the line with physical play. You also blocked a ton of shots. Uh, when you played, there was a bunch of guys that would flamingo and get out of the way. It doesn't seem to happen anymore. Like everybody's got to get in the way. Maybe there's a couple of superstars that don't. Um, do you remember some instances where you would see somebody come back to the bench and not block a shot. Would you have said anything back then or would you say it now because the way the game is played? Oh no, we, yeah. I mean, when I'm so first, when I was a player, we would definitely address it. Like I, some guys would address it differently than I would. I just, I would just kind of lean over and say, Hey, we need you to block that shot. You can't get out of the way. And some guys would yell for, for everybody to hear, um, you know, you know, fast forward to this year as a coach, you know, we've, we've talked about JJ and, you know, getting on the penalty kill, the one thing he needed, need, still needs to improve is his shot blocking. And I can understand if guys aren't used to it and they start getting stung with pucks, it's not, it's not fun. And you'd <laughs> avoid it at all costs at, at times, but he'd come to the bench and I'd lean over and I still, I wouldn't yell, but I'd lean over and I said, you know, you got to effing, you can't get out of the effing way there. Your team is, <laughs> is, is counting on you to block that shot. If you want these opportunities, if you want Webby to still call your name on the penalty kill, you got to make sure you're blocking those shots. So um, I think it'll be a work in progress in that aspect, but yeah, you, you, you definitely have to address it. You definitely have to address it because if it's not addressed, 
the next guy might do it. He's like, hey, he didn't have to do it. Why am I going to do it? You know, and that's that's the case with anything that happens in a game. We didn't get a full season of Lucas Rusek, but what can you say about his end of the year and what's next for him? When when in practice and in games, Jack Quinn comes to the bench with his eyes like bugged out going, wow, that guy's unreal. Like, you know, he's a player like for that kid to come back after his lengthy layoff, ACL surgery, the whole bit. And to play with the calmness and poise that he did and the speed that he did was incredible. I, I can't wait to see him in training camp for the Sabres um, and see how he performs. And then, you know, getting a season, start of a season in Rochester next year. This kid made just as many, if not more high-end offensive plays than anybody all season. And he only played a third of the season. Like, it was it was unbelievable. Um, so... He's uh, he, he was a treat, and I think he's only going to get better. Okay, the Sabres tweeted that on Wednesday or Thursday morning, but first NHL game milestone, Jack Quinn, J.J. Paterka, Ethan Prowl, Brendan Byro, Owen Power, and Casey Fitzgerald. All six, um, do they all have, I don't want to say long successful, but are they all NHL players? And obviously, Prowl and Byro are probably the two that people are going to ask Are they NHL players? Where do you see uh, Prow and Byro be uh, in a couple of years from now? I think Prow, just given his age and the miles and stuff like that, it's hard to see him being um, at this point of his career a full time NHLer. Crazy things can happen. Who knows? Um, I think Byro can still find his way as a utility player. I mean, he skates extremely well. He can play in every single situation. He can play all three, four positions. He has value. He has versatility and those are the type of guys that seem to find their way one way or another, whether it's with this organization or another, I think um, he's got the determination to do it. And I think he's only 23, 24 years old. So it's not like he's, he's late in his career. Um, so it'll be, it'll be fun to see. I mean, uh, Brandon Byro was probably along with JJ and, and Russeline and the most important players on our roster through late December into February Um, I mean, Byro did get hurt again uh, in, later in that stretch to miss the last part of the season. But um, the, the level of play that Byro had for stretches was absolutely incredible. Can you share a word or two on uh, Andrew Ogilvy? <laughs> Ogs is the best. Um, <laughs> let let so, me just preface this by, not, by saying, Michael, that a lot of our audience, you know, it was very unfortunate that he suffered another injury. And a lot of our audience throughout the year was what's up with Ogilvy? What's, what's happening? Is he, is he ever going to be able to make it back health wise and, and things like that? Um, if, if you're able to maybe just share a little uh, of what you can, as far as what Ogilvy was like uh, in and around your group yeah. this year, and maybe what's, what yeah. he's so, looking to do. So early in the season, you know, I, I mean, I don't know if I had ever met him before. Um, and so he would pop in and out and he, there'd be a, this guy would be in the meeting and then he wouldn't be there for a couple of days. And then he'd pop up walking around the locker room. And this was earlier in the year when I think he was still kind of symptomatic and things were going on, whatever. And you're like calling security. Like there's well, some straggler finally, walking around. I, I think I finally said to ask him like, who's that guy? Over there? Like, who is that? He goes, Oh, that's Ogilvy. I go, okay. And I knew the name. So I'm like, okay. Um, but then you can see as the season, like once we got into like the, second third month of the season in the morning he'd get there early in the morning and he'd come down to our war room downstairs in the coach's war room downstairs we have big table tvs we that's where we spend practice days is downstairs and he'd just sit there and you know we we you know ask questions and just start chit-chatting and and then finally one day i'm like why don't we get him doing some video stuff and some pre like he can start presenting pre-scouts get him get him more involved he's obviously wants to get involved he can we kind of be like a coach for us. He can come on and practice and all this stuff in a sweatsuit. And sure enough, it started to evolve where, you know, you know, for the season, Mike Weber and I would do all the pre-scouts, you know, we'd rotate pre-scouts and then we got Ogilvy into the rotation. Then he was out in practice. And um, even early on in the practice part, like he'd still go on and then miss a couple of days getting used to the lights and everything else out on the rink. Like it was, he was dealing with something, but then by the end of the season, you know, Uh, the last month of the season, we had all the extra bodies we'd have, you know, on game days, we'd have, you know, game scrimmages, coaches against players, like three different teams. And he was looking forward to that stuff, but, you know, phenomenal 
human being. He's a, he was a phenomenal player, you know, Notre Dame and it's too bad his pro career got cut short, but, you know, I think he's uh, with, with what he learned this year, I think he's going to go on and, and be involved with the coaching staff at university of Notre Dame next year. And tell you that he's, he's a brilliant kid. He sees a lot of really cool things and, in the game of hockey. And I wouldn't be surprised if he's coaching, you know, pro hockey or head coach of college at some point in the next uh, five, six years. So since you guys added him to the rotation for the pre-scout, did that give you more free time on game day to go to the movie theater? Because that looked like it was your routine. Seth would say, I'm going home. Then I'll come back. I'll work out. I'll go for a jog. We'd say, okay, what's Peck's doing? He's gone to the movie theater. That's what he does on game day. So, uh, Did you have more time to watch more movies? No, that 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 had nothing to do with the uh, post morning skate time. Because um, I mean, fortunately for me, because I ran the power play, all power play meetings were in the morning, so I had nothing to do. You know, I had nothing to do the rest of the afternoon. Um, so the the worst part of the season for me is when there was like a movie drop, when there's like no new releases, and you know, I I watched all these movies with because we had a home stretch. So I watched like six movies in two weeks, and. Um, so I'd have, I'd have to find something else to do. So I just stay in the coach's office and watch movies in there, but yeah, it was good routine. I go there, I go to Wegmans and get a sub and I go get some whiskey for the coach's room for after our wins. And that's kind of how it went. Are you missing at all? Or are you celebrating time away from Seth and Webby? I think we all miss each other. To be honest, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll all kind of reconnect in Montreal, uh, the coaches conference and first, first day of the draft. And, and then shortly after that uh, development camp. So we'll, we'll get back to work together again uh, real soon, but you know, it, it was a successful season. I think in large part too, is as a coaching staff, we are very cohesive, very collaborative. And um, you know, it's like any healthy, you know uh, you know, locker room. I think uh, when, when the coaching staff is all on the same page and um, all the same kind of personality, it just kind of filters through the locker room. What, uh, what about your road to where you went last year? I mean, you coach Trevor, your son and youth hockey from the 15 U, 16 U, whatnot. You kind of went to Washington during the, uh, the, the pandemic shortened season as a skills type of assistant coach and then now to Rochester where is that going to continue to take you obviously next year you're planning and you're focusing on Roch but where do you see yourself go in uh, five to ten years from now you know why like I, it's funny like, I, I was asked that question when I was going through the draft combine thing back then and you know like where do you see yourself in five to ten years I'm like I'm only focused on this off season, you know, like I, whatever happens will happen because of the work I put in the next month or two months or three months. I think, you know, apps actually asked me that conversation, you know, before I got hired last year is, you know, where do you see yourself going? Do you want to be a head coach? I said, I, I am not focused at all on being a head coach, being in the NHL. I'm focused on, you know, I think that's why our staff and me personally, I was able to, you know, dive in and have the successes. I was just, I was just dialed in on, the players this year and our team this year. And that's no different. You know, like all I'm focused on now is development camp and getting to know some of the newer kids. And, you know, we'll have all of our guys from the season this year um, and making sure that I'll lean on them during development camp to be leaders for the next crop of kids coming in. And, and then from that point on, it's getting stuff ready for training camp. And if anything happens in between then after next year, whatever, that'll happen because, you know, you've earned the opportunity for a discussion for something else, but, um, but I really, like, I really don't foresee like, or plan ahead or hope for anything. I just, it doesn't matter to me. I mean, I, you know, after the, you know, they the Sabres assigned me to a one-year extension with Rochester, you know, when that's done, I may say, you know what, this was great. Now I'm going to go live in Florida. I, I don't know. Like I just, I take it one, one day at a time, you know, I love it. Uh, Michael, we've got to wrap up. We normally do, uh, like Marty and I do three stars of the past week, but I would love it if you, uh, very briefly just gave us three names from the Amherst roster that have not been mentioned yet in this almost hour long conversation, three guys that, uh, that you think are worthy of a little shout out for what they brought to the table this year. Um, I think for our team, three guys that should get shout out. I think Aaron Dell is one for us. I mean, he was an incredible leader for not just our team in general, for our young guys, in particular, our young forwards, giving them really good tips and, you know, how to uh, manipulate goaltenders in a lot of different areas. And, 
Um, it's amazing how close our young forwards became uh, got with with Aaron Dell. Um, I think Ryan McInnes. I think Ryan McInnes was was a real quiet kid early in the season, but the way um, that we just continue to show trust in him and the way he started to play and see him smile around the rink, um, I think he became a a kind of a quiet inspiration for everybody because he kind of grew on everybody. And I think the last one, you know, probably Jimmy Schultz or it's a tie, Jimmy Schultz, but even more so Peter Tisch. I think Tisch was a guy that was a glue for our young guys and was, uh, you know, kind of a, a big brother to a lot of our young guys, showed it in games with his toughness and willingness to fight and stick up for people and always had a smile, even when he was in pain, dislocated his shoulder, he's always had a smile on his face and, uh, and Jimmy Schultz, I'll just add a fourth is, you know, just his work habits off the ice and his ability to, you know, be so professional and focused on what his job was. Um, I think those are guys that, you know, meant a lot to our team this year, for sure. Love it. Got to have guys like that. And uh, I'm glad that you were able to have that in Rochester this year. It was really fun to watch. And honestly, Michael, this was a, a really enlightening last hour. We thank you so much. Yep. All right, guys. Enjoyed it. That was some amazing insight. <laughs> from Michael today. Uh, it's going to be hard to top the dirty bird, angry bird story <laughs> moving forward involving JJ Paterka. But Marty, like I, I can only imagine the number of times over the years in your career that situations, be it in practice or games or whatever, resulted in a, you know, a nickname being attached to a practice drill or an in-game moment. Yeah. yeah. Lind Lindy Ruff was really uh, funny about that because he had a drill called the Canada Cup. And, and the drill is like, it's changed name and every organization I've been with, but it ref I, always goes to me as this is a Canada Cup drill or it'd be the Dallas Stars two-on-one. I'm like, well, where did you guys get that? Oh, I saw the Dallas Stars do it one day and I was a good two-on-one. So we called it the Dallas Stars two-on-one. But you go to other team and it may be called a two-on-one regroup or a two-on-one straight up or whatnot. So certain drills always stick to you because of the name. So the Dirty Bird drill, now named the Dirty JJ or the Angry Bird, will be something that will stick with me now for a while because that story. Don't you love... Maybe I shouldn't bring this up, but don't you love it when presumably a little bit of a language barrier or gap oh. <laughs> ends up translating, if you will, into absolute laughter and enjoyment for the entirety of the group? <laughs> Again, I will say a lot of the this or that and the language that comes out of me is it stems from a situation on the bench in 1995, 96, when I got called up to Buffalo, I'm sitting there. And I'm like, come on, let's go, guys. Let's kill that penalty. And I believe it was Doug Bodger sending next to me. And he goes, Marty, let's kill this penalty. When it is going to be killed, it will become that penalty. And I was like, what? And I still remember that. We're talking about 95, 96. We're talking about, you know, almost 30 years ago. And I still remember the fact that ahead of time, it's this. Once it's passed, it became that. You had an in-game grammar lesson from a oh, veteran yeah. defenseman. This yes. is amazing. Yes. And Why I did I not know the it. specifics of this before? I also in game called my father from the phone on the bench. Um, he was at a restaurant actually watching our game. I didn't believe the phone was real. I thought it was just a communication from the locker room to the bench. Jim Pizzatelli goes, what's your dad's number? And, you know, my dad had one of those big cell phone and I called his cell phone. And uh, yeah, he's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I just wanted to see if the phone was real. But yeah, that happened. Did you leave a callback number like the NHL did? No, one I did time? not. I don't even know. Like they don't work. They don't have phones on the bed, but they used to have a phone in the uh, uh, goal judge, uh, you know, like a uh, yeah. boot because oh if the referee wanted to talk to him, they had to pull the phone. Yeah. Um, so there was phones all over the place, but those were actually real phone. If the goal judge felt like calling for, uh, you know, a, a late night snack, he could have done it. Oh, you've given me so many ideas for where we should consider hosting locations in arena for broadcast next year, like next to where the goal judge, like hypothetically, like where a goal judge would sit, where a concussion spotter would sit, like, oh, like find a different area, like in the video room, in the trainer's room, you know, well, the goal judge doesn't sit behind the net anymore, I know. but that's it. I still want the goal judge back. I want I the guy behind the net that lights up the light 
what happened in game four in Tampa? The uh, shot misses the net. The horn goes off. It wasn't even close. They stopped the play because of it. The goal judge sometimes would, would miss if it went under the bar and out, yeah. but they were pretty accurate. Yeah, I agree. And so was Michael Pekka in his evaluations of uh, many oh, players so today. Good. So, so good. good. Thank you, Marty. Thank you, Michael. And thank you for watching. We'll see you next time on Instigators Overtime. Presented by Seneca Resorts and Casinos.